Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Don Cherry, not the hockey commentator, but the singer-golfer. Don Cherry died at the age of 94. He was a good old boy from Texas, and he could really play golf. He won a couple of amateur championships in the 50s. He was on three victorious U.S. Walker Cup teams in the 50s and early 60s, and he even finished ninth in the 1960 U.S. Open, won by Arnold Palmer. That's all well and good, but it wouldn't get him a spot on the show. But he happened to be a great singer as well. And he had a top five hit in 1955, which most people probably don't remember. It was redone by Mel Carter in the 60s. But it resurfaced as the song that introduced Don Draper in the television series Mad Men. Here is Don Cherry singing a little bit of Band of Gold. <laughs> Doesn't seem like he got along that well with Clifford Roberts, the chairman at Augusta, but he did a song about Augusta and the Masters once. And that's his buddy and fellow Texan and golf aficionado Willie Nelson in the background. Well, you got your golf tournaments, you got your band of gold, you got your appearances on Dean Martin's television shows, but Don Cherry made more money from this and is actually recognized by more people than all those put together. In 1958, Procter & Gamble introduced a new household cleaner. We talked about it when we did the Richard Black podcast I refer you to, and Don Cherry sang the theme song, which we closed with then, and we'll just incorporate it again tonight. Because let's face it, it's an earworm. Mr. Clean, it's red of garden, garden, creep and dust and bed. Mr. Clean, go clean your whole house and everything that's in our Sadie, clean the kiss the freezer. Well, no one does it easier. Sadie's helping laundry too. Why, there's nothing he can't do. Mr. Clean, it's red of garden, garden, creep and dust and bed. Mr. Clean, go clean your whole house and everything that's in our well, we're going to move on to our feature tonight, Barbara Harris, who died recently at the age of 83, an absolutely superb actress, both on the stage and on the screen, but in both cases, as good as she was, she never became the star that she could have been. She was a nice Catholic girl from Evanston, Illinois. She went to Senn High School. And in the mid-50s, she became part of the Compass Players. And we talked about the Compass Players before when we did the Mike Nichols podcast, when we did the Bernie Solins podcast. But she was actually the first person to appear on stage for the Compass Players, along with Mike Nichols and Ed Asner and Paul Sills. She was a superb improvisational actress. And I thought we'd just take a little segue into the history of the Compass Players. So Paul Sills and David Shepard combined together to create the Compass, and the Compass was the first ever modern improvisational theater company, and that took place on the south side in the Hyde Park area, where it was an amazing collection of young minds that were all there together because the University of Chicago had a very open admission policy, so like almost everybody who was trying to get away from Eisenhower era the United States and wanted to find some place to congregate, they all came to the University of Chicago. University of Chicago didn't have a theater movement, they created their own theater. And all these brilliant minds and brilliant people got together at the University of Chicago, including you know David Shepard and Paul Sills. They created the Compass, the Compass became successful and expanded, and the Compass was that sort of first ever storefront theater, along with the Playwrights Theater Club, which was its direct predecessor. Storefront theater was not heard of pretty well anywhere in the United States. It was always big, large theaters, Storefront Theater was an outgrowth of what the Playwrights Theater Club and the Compass did, which then led to Second City when they converted a Chinese laundry, and it's just grown. So Chicago is known for storefront theater. In fact, in Europe, they talk about storefront theater, and it's only beginning to take on uh, a life of its own in Europe, and it all goes back to Chicago. So it keeps going back to that this city had the right 
energy, the right culture, uh, the right university, the right time period, uh, and the, for all of these things to combine and create the sort of transformational energy. I mean, even the University of Chicago, they created the atom bomb, which is nothing more than just a really big transformation. When I walked into the compass, it had a mystery about it. It had something special before the show ever started. Um, it was small, small stage, and I don't know how big the audience was. It wasn't very big. At least I remember that it wasn't. And the music was wonderful. I mean, it really caught the feeling of the place. And you became part of it. When the show started, you were part of it. Well, she was definitely part of it. She didn't have the immediate success that Nichols and May did. She did a Second City Review in 1961 on Broadway. Got a Tony nomination for that. She bopped around television for a couple of years. Did an Alfred Hitchcock Presents as her debut, which is significant because she came back and did a Hitchcock movie in the 70s. Her first breakout role was in A Thousand Clowns, where she was the romantic interest for Jason Robards. Then she went back to the theater and she was in two superb productions in the 60s, both of which she won Tony nominations for. The first was On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. Here's my man Cyril Richard, the pirate captain of Peter Pan, introducing her on the Bell Telephone Hour. In his current Broadway show, On a Clear Day You Can See Forever, written with composer Burton Lane, there's a process going on every night that's simply incredible. The hero, in this case, actually delves into the young lady's subconscious and brings forth an entirely different woman. This remarkable female is played on Broadway by the young lady that you see here, Miss Barbara Harris. Hey, what's below? Up is where it grows. Up from which below can't tell you. Hurry, it's lovely up here. Life down a hole takes a off the toll. What with not a soul there to share with? nominated again for the Tony, but she lost. But the next year she won for the Apple Tree. Speaking of Peter Pan, here's Mary Martin talking about seeing her in the Apple Tree. And I don't know if Mary Martin was aware of Barbara Harris's improv background. I remember the first time I saw this next actress. One night when I wasn't working, my husband and I went to the theater and there she was. I was so excited by what I saw. Her somehow intangible quality, her ability to give the impression she was making up her lines as she went along. I had seen nothing like it since Lorette Taylor. Well, I got so excited I went to see her three more times. The lovable comedian here with her talented co-star Larry Blyden. In a scene from the second nominee for the best musical, The Apple Tree, is Barbara Harris. Ella was a chimney sweep. She worked in a big office building downtown, but it wasn't what she really wanted to do. Oh, no, I'm only doing this for a living. As she often tried to tell people, Chimneys are cozy, chimneys are warm. I think of chimneys as ports in a storm. Got warm and cozy or not. Lorette Taylor, boy, you're almost going back to the turn of the century. I don't think Mary Martin saw her there. She probably saw her in the glass menagerie at the end of World War II. Well, as I said, Barbara Harris won the Tony for the apple tree. And here's another one of my main men, Zero, announcing her victory over some pretty stiff competition. These next four ladies sure do know. The nominees for Best Actress in the Musical Comedy are Barbara Harris in the apple tree, Lotta Lenya in Cabaret, Mary Martin in I Do, I Do, Louise Troy and Walking Happy. The winner is Barbara Harris. Can't include her speech. It was rather subdued. Turns out she was going out with Warren Beatty and he broke up with her that afternoon. And she didn't take it too well. Can you believe that? Warren Beatty was going out with an actress in the 60s and broke up with her? Amazing. After that, she went back to movies. As I said, she did a Hitchcock movie. She did Family Plot. There were only about 20 or 25 Hitchcock actors still alive, by the way. And she did Freaky Friday and Peggy Sue Got Married. But unquestionably, her greatest role was in the 1975 Robert Altman film Nashville. Here she plays a wannabe country singer named Albuquerque and closes the movie with a song after a shooting at an outdoor rally. You may say I ain't free. You don't worry me. Oh, you don't worry me. You don't worry me. You may say I ain't free. You don't. Oh, 
Barbara Harris, great talent, should have been a bigger star. We will let our next subject identify himself with his distinctive British accent. I'm Robin Leach. Robin Leach died recently at the age of 76, host of the popular television show of the 1980s and 90s, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. He followed all these super rich people around, told us where they lived, what they ate, where they traveled, that kind of stuff. There's no middle ground on Robin Leach. You either thought he was an unctuous television twit, or you thought this guy was in on some big in-joke. He got to start the Daily Mail in Britain when he was 18 years old. 1963, he came to the United States, kept that English accent, wrote for a couple of American newspapers, including the New York Daily News, People in the Ladies' Home Journal, made it to television in Los Angeles, and I guess it was sort of a logical extension of that, that he got the gig for Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Here's NBC News on the death of Robin Leach. It's another dazzling lifestyles of the rich and famous. With his British accent and penchant for all things posh, Robin Leach became a household name, celebrating the lifestyles of the rich and famous. From a villa in the Canary Islands to a ranch in Kenya. In the 80s and 90s, the former tabloid reporter took viewers on a lavish journey into the world of the well-to-do allowing us all to dream a little for one hour each week. Just remember one thing, don't forget the bubbly! The Starstruck met everyone from Liberace and his half-dozen homes to Knott's Landing's Donna Mills. Of course, this is good, too. And Raquel Welch. She's rich, famous, powerful, beautiful, and oh, so mysterious. In 1994, he took us inside the lavish three-story 50-room penthouse inhabited by Donald Trump and then-wife Marla Maples. From humble beginnings, Leach became a multi-millionaire himself. Here's Robin Leach talking to Larry King about his philosophy. I think all of us are born with a streak of curiosity. We're just a little bit nosy. We want to know what goes on next door. And I think over the years, we've always thought that rich people uh, live this larger-than-life life that we would love to do maybe for an hour, maybe for a day. They're Remember that old show, King, for a day? Yeah. Well, they aren't really that different from you and I, except one thing that's there's difference is the zeros in their bank accounts are much many more zeros than we have in our bank accounts. But when you talk with anybody, be it the average Joe in the street in Kansas City, and he says, did the Sultan of Brunei really have a dining room that had 4,500 people to sit down? And I say, yes, he did. And they say, boy, it's incredible. So they, they all want to know. It's just plain old fascinating curiosity. And we'll leave Robin Leach with his famous sign-off. With champagne wishes and caviar dreams. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And we're going to close tonight with Miriam Nelson, who died recently at the age of 98. Miriam Nelson was born Miriam Frankel, nice Jewish girl from Chicago. Her mother worked at the Chez Paris. Miriam became a dancer and a choreographer. She did a little acting. She was Edward G. Robinson's secretary in Double Indemnity. He had a cameo in Breakfast at Tiffany's. But she was known primarily as the Marnie Nixon of dancing. She did a lot of the tap sounds for people like Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, and even Ginger Rogers. But we're closing with her because of her fame as a choreographer. She choreographed the most sexy dance scene in movie history, that between William Holden and Kim Novak in the 1956 movie Picnic. And yes, I know about Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey. It's not even close. I never thought Picnic was a great movie, but that dance scene is a classic. The whole movie is worth it just for William Holden and Kim Novak dancing in the moonlight at the fair to the theme from Picnic, which morphs into Moonglow. So as a closing tribute to Miriam Nelson, here's a little bit of the music from that scene. I did graceful. You used to dance like that, Flo. Thank you.